I guarantee you've had that conversation before where you ask your significant other, what do you want to eat for dinner? And they say, well, I don't care. You pick. And then you pick and you tell them and they say, well, I didn't want that. Now, as a fly angler, you've probably experienced an even more frustrating version of that exact conversation while you've been out on the water. You've picked out a great food option. You're making decent casts, and the fish are just being picky as all get out. They're refusing everything you throw at them, except with fish, you really can't just ask them, hey, what do you want for dinner? Catching these picky trout is probably responsible for more angler headaches than just about anything else in fly fishing. The good news is that on today's episode of Untangled, I'm going to walk you through some tips to help you catch these picky fish. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant, having more fun than a human being ought to have because honestly that's the name of the game here at untangled and it and adventures fly kill let's be honest we're all about having a blast while we do this fly fishing thing and speaking of this fly fishing thing this week's show the main topic on the show is going to be all about tips for catching picky trout and it you know i know from experience and i mean anybody who's been out there fly fishing knows that there are few things in life more infuriating. Maybe mothers-in-law, lawyers, the IRS, uh, those three would probably be more infuriating. But then right below them, you're going to have trout that refuse to eat your fly, even though everything about it is perfect. And that's the situation we're going to talk about today because those situations, rightfully, make you want to tear your daggum hair out. It, it's just, it's nuts. So we're going to dive into... Uh, a whole bunch of tips about how to catch these picky trout. And I'm going to give you some information that will hopefully help explain why these trout are so picky. Because again, one of the big things that we do here at VFC and at Untangled is I'm not satisfied to just give you, well, here, do this, this, and this, you'll catch a fish. I want to help you understand the why. So we're going to dive into the why behind these trout being so picky and why they refuse you sometimes. And you know, complete transparency right up at the front here. There's not always a good reason. <laughs> Sometimes those fish are just in a mood, right? It's like, you know, I, 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 I teach high school, right? And, and uh, sometimes those kids, they're, they're just in a mood and nothing you do is going to change that. It's the same dagum thing with trout. But anyways, uh, we actually have Tim from Texas to thank for this topic because he wrote in a while ago. And his question said, hey, guys, hope all is well. The closest fishery to me is a tailwater, about a two and a half, three hour drive. Do you have any tips that would help for a successful day on a tailwater as the trout can be picky? Also, here's a link to the history of wings. Well, thank you, Tim. That is the content that I am here for, folks. I need more of that. All right. And less of the snark. No, I'm kidding. I love this snark, too. Uh. That History of Wings link was fantastic, Tim. Thank you very much. I actually got to go to the Anchor Bar last year and eat wings at the OG Wing Place. So that was really special. It was over Super Bowl weekend, and I'm going to get a little bit of hate here. I was cheering for the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, but it, it was it was fantastic. It, it was great. So I'm eating wings. I'm watching the Chiefs win. And I'm eating wings at the place they were invented. It, it was it was the closest thing I think I'll ever come to experiencing heaven in a mortal's body. But <laughs> anyways, let's dig into the real question here, which was the uh, uh, tips about catching picky trout. Now, Tim specifically did mention fishing on a tailwater, uh, as those trout do tend to be the pickiest. But the tips that I am sharing today are going to help you catch just about any picky trout in any kind of water. Again, tail waters just have that reputation for having a lot of picky trout because uh, of a lot of a, a lot of the different factors that go into creating a tail water, which we're going to talk about. And a tail water, for those who don't know, that is the river that comes out directly below a dam, and these rivers tend to be crystal clear. And because of the nature of the temperature of the water coming out of the dam 
There's a lot of stability there, a lot of weed growth and whatnot. They do tend to have a lot of prolific hatches, and the fish can grow really big in tailwaters. So that adds up to a ton, a ton, a, a metric crap ton, if you will, of anglers who are going to pressure these fish year round because tailwaters usually will fish well year round. So those fish don't get much of a break. So these fish are more quote unquote educated than the fish in your, say, your local high country stream or the nearby creek or even in that canal down the road. They're going to be a lot more educated because they are seeing every fly from every fly shop and every fly tire's vice, and they're seeing it a couple hundred times a day, and they're seeing bad presentations. They're seeing good presentations. They know what works. They know what doesn't. And these fish are just very discerning, right? They can, they can pick out a, a natural drift from a fake one, uh, sometimes with alarming uh, ability. It makes you think, you know, we talk all the time, well, try have the brain the size of a strawberry or they're not sentient. Go to the Green River during a blanket blue-winged olive hatch and tell me that they're not sentient because good criminy, I swear they are. <laughs> oh, but what exactly causes some trout to get pickier than others? Well, to understand how to catch those picky fish. Again, you need to understand why they get picky, like I told you guys earlier. So in general, you're going to see three reasons that trout get picky, regardless of uh, whether you're on a tailwater or you're on your local freestone, or even I've run into some picky uh, trout even up in the high country, like 9,000 feet. So even up there, they can't get picky. And there's three main factors that are going to contribute to that pickiness. And the first one is pressure, right? If the fish see a ton of anglers, they get a lot of pressure. They are going to be more discerning at both fly patterns and fly presentation. Trout wise up quickly to being caught, and the more pressure they get, the pickier they become. Sort of like me with my wing connoisseurism, and that is a word. Okay, I'm an English teacher. I'm allowed to make up words. Uh, you know, people can say, oh, these wings are really good. They'll tell me, these wings are great, man. You got to try them. And I'll go try them and, oh, they're too vinegary. Or, uh, yeah, too, too much hot sauce. Or, uh, not enough garlic. Or, did you even use any butter in this sauce? Okay, a, a newbie to the wing world wouldn't understand that. But somebody who eats a lot of wings is going to understand that. It's the same thing with anything, right? The trout are going to understand what is real and what isn't when they've been pressured a whole ton. And they'll get picky. They'll only want to eat the stuff that they think is real. And just to give you a real life example of this, the Green River in Utah, one of my favorite places to fish, and I'm not, I'm not hot spotting the green. I, I, I want to make it crystal clear. When I mention a river by name on this podcast, it's not because I'm trying to get under anybody's skin or be like, hey, go fish here. It's amazing. There are certain places in the fly fishing world that are well known and They've been well known for years, and that's not going to change. And me talking about it on Untangled is not going to result in 10,000 more people fishing there this year. So I just want to get that out of the way. Uh, Green River. You go in the start of the year, it's wonderful dry fly fishing. When the first hatches come off, the fish are hungry. They've been eating little midges uh, all winter long. They're ready for some real food, a lot of food choices. They are having a blast. They just can't get enough of it. And I, I saw this back when I lived in Utah, I would fish the green. Oh, sometimes two, three times a week. I was out there a lot. And early on in the season, dry fly fishing was super easy. And then you get to about August and August is usually when the big tourist season winds down. So the, the guides aren't running at full capacity anymore. A lot of the private boats are gone and those fish, are so timid. They are so scared. It's actually kind of funny because you'll be fishing dries and the hatch will be wonderful and the fish will just come up and they'll just barely, just ever so carefully take that dry fly off the top. They they act timid because they, they're, they've been caught so much and they're sick of being caught so much. And they're scared, honestly, I, I think is what it comes down to. And you'll see that in a lot of places where there's really good dry fly fishing like that where as the season comes to an end, the fish do wise up a ton. So you, you even see it in real time, okay? So 
pressure will make the fish picky. Another reason that's going to make the fish picky is if they are keyed in on a certain bug during a hatch. Sometimes the fish are only going to want one of the bugs that's hatching. Sometimes they want a specific life cycle stage of the bug that's hatching. Uh, They only want the emerger, or maybe they only want the cripple, right? It just depends on what the fish are feeling and the mood that they're in. We actually have a ton of detail on this particular topic in our Pick the Right Fly episode of the Masterclass, which I will link in the podcast description for y'all. But that is one reason why fish can be picky. If it seems like they're passing up your bug every time, there's a very good chance that you just don't have the uh, the right life cycle stage of that particular fly on there at the time. So pressure, hatches. Last thing that's really going to contribute, regardless of where the fish are at, to make them picky is their environment. Right? What I mean by that is in really clear, slow water, fish can be more selective. They have the time to sit there, and I believe it was John Gerak once who wrote that uh, it, it seems like on some of these rivers, the trout count the tail feathers on your fly before deciding whether or not to eat it. And I've always loved that visualization because it feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? Well, on slow, clear water, they've got the time to do it. A lot of tailwaters have slow, clear water. That's one of uh, one of their defining characteristics for many of them. But conversely, if you are fishing river that has a lot of very tight pockets, uh, not a lot of really long, slow stretches, and the growing season is short, what I mean by that is if you're up in the high country, really you've got after runoff before the snow comes in for the fish to bulk up a lot and eat. So that's a pretty short window of time to grow. Those fish have to be more opportunistic just by nature of where they live, right? So the environment's going to play a big role in whether or not these fish are picky. So now that we know why fish can get picky, how do we go about catching them? When they they get in that mood and, well, you can't make me do anything if I don't want to. And they're giving you the middle fin, right? They're just, you're about ready to tear your hair out. You're wondering, man, I spent all this money. I got invested in fly fishing. I'm standing out here in these waders. I'm waving a stick like an idiot, and I can't catch this fish with a brain the size of a walnut or a strawberry or whatever random food item we want to compare a trout's brain to. And I don't know why there's such a wide variety of things we compare a trout's brain to. It's, and I've, I've heard all of those, so that's why I threw them all in there. Well, there are five tips that I'm going to share with you today that I think can help you catch these picky fish. All right. Number one, uh, and it's funny that I put this one, excuse me. It's funny that I put this one number one because uh, I almost never advise people to do this, but sometimes you just have to do it. And that is sizing down your tippet. Now, the reason I say, well, maybe don't do it is when we size down our tippet, we have a tendency to play the fish longer because we don't want to break the tippet. And that's a very valid concern. It's a valid uh, problem to have. But at the same time, you don't want to play the fish too long. And that is uh, something I know I did as a beginner when I would tie on like 6X or even 7X, I would play the fish to exhaustion. And we just did a show a couple of weeks ago now about how to uh, catch and release fish. And that was one of the big things in there. You don't want to play that fish longer than you absolutely have to. So I shy away from sizing down tippet uh, and telling people to size down tippet because your goal should be to get that fish in as quickly as possible. And with that lighter tippet, sometimes it's kind of impossible. So this is one of the last resort things, but sometimes it's the only thing that will work. Uh, To give you an example of it, I was out fishing it would have been last fall with my buddy here, uh, one of the other teachers, actually, at the school that I teach at. And he and I were out. Uh, we were floating this river not too far from my house. And we got in this wonderful uh, late season mayfly hatch. We're throwing our bugs up there, and the fish are just ignoring everything. I know it's the right life cycle stage because they're eating emergers. I can tell by their rise forms. I can tell what they're eating. They're eating emergers. I have an emerger on. And the only thing I could think of was the tippet was too big. It was causing a little bit of micro drag and how flat and clear this water was. And so I sized down the tippet and I wanted to go to 6X, but I didn't have any 6X. So I had to go down to seven and I tied it on for my buddy 
and he throws his cast out there, and first cast to 7X tip it, boom, he hooks up. Beautiful big brown. It jumped two or three times, and he's almost got it to the boat, and the tippet snapped. So it was pretty sad. But it worked because he caught the fish, and that was the difference. We, we both went down to 7X, and after that, we started bringing the fish in. So sometimes it does happen uh, that you have to size down tippet, but again, that's usually my last resort. I try and do everything else first, and then I'll size the tippet down. Now, I just mentioned uh, this in the uh, a second ago. This is the second tip that I would give you for how to catch these picky fish, and that is look at the rice forms and tie on the appropriate the appropriate bug that the fish are eating off the top. Rice forms, all that is is when a fish comes up to eat a bug off the surface of the water, they create a disturbance. It's that big ring, and we call that a rise form. And the way they rise is going to tell you if they're eating a dun, which is the adult version, or if they're eating a mergers, which are the little, uh, the, they're half, easiest way to think about it is they're halfway between a nymph and uh, a dun. They're just emerging up to become a fully fledged adult, but they're not quite adults yet. And they're stuck in the surface film and the fish will come up and snack on those. When they're eating a mergers, what you'll usually see, instead of seeing the trout's nose break the water, you'll see their dorsal fin and their tail fin. You won't see their nose break the water at all. If you're seeing their nose break the water, that means they're more than likely eating duns or cripples, stuff that's on top of the water and not stuck in that surface film. Uh, we've also got uh, a little bit of a section in one of our videos on uh, rice form. So I'm going to go ahead and link that in the podcast description as well. For y'all, and this ties back into picking the right fly, like I mentioned a while ago. So, tip number three perfect your presentation, right? You've decided that, okay, this, this fish is eating emergers. Well, now you've got to make sure you put that emerger in front of a fish in a way that looks natural, that looks normal, that looks like something a fish is going to want to eat. And regardless of if, it, of if you're fishing dries or nymphs, presentation is the, excuse me. Excuse me, goodness. Presentation is the number one issue that we all have as fly anglers, and it is the number one thing to fix before you change a fly, before you change tippet, anything else. Make sure your presentation is as good as you can get it. Your goal is perfect, right? You, you don't always get perfect, but your goal is to be as perfect as possible with that presentation. I, I just can't overstate enough how important good presentation is often when we're talking about fish and dry flies but as well with nymphs uh getting a good presentation means you're eliminating drag so you're you're not having any drag on your fly at all and it also means that you're getting your flies to the correct depth if you're fishing nymphs or you're putting them in the exact correct feeding lane for dry flies all right uh i was out on a river oh couple weeks ago just to give you an example of this and it was actually on my way home from visiting family in Utah and my wife was <laughs> so I, I we parked and we walked down we took our dog to the water with us who we got a little pappy on and no I don't want to hear any small dog jokes all right he's the best dog ever but we we all walked down to the river and I threw my waders on and I walk into the river and I was standing on this rock trying to get this drift right and I slipped off the rock, fell, filled my waders up. And my wife just looks at me like, why'd you do that? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm cold, but I'm going to go fish one more spot and then we can leave. <laughs> and so my waders are full of water. I'm cold. It's windy. Uh, I didn't really want to keep fishing, but I wanted to catch fish. Well, I shoot up to this next little spot and I'm just drifting my nymphs through uh, through this kind of a rock garden is probably the best way to describe it. And I wasn't catching anything. So I start making incremental adjustments, just tiny little adjustments. Uh, I actually brought my indicator down because I was going too deep. And I made two or three incremental adjustments, moved it. I think I moved the indicator a total of like nine inches. And as soon as I did that, once I got it in the right spot, boom, two fish back to back. So those incremental adjustments in your presentation really do matter. And those are going to contribute 
to your success as an angler. So don't overlook the importance of getting a good presentation. Right, your fourth tip, and we've talked about this quite a lot uh, already. We've talked about, you know, looking at rise forms. But again, I just want to throw this in here. Uh, picking the right fly matters quite a lot, whether you're fishing nymphs or dry flies, right? Uh, often we focus so much on matching the hatch. We've got to get the exact right fly out there in front of the fish, and it's got to be perfect. But sometimes, especially on tailwater, you'll have these blanket hatches, and that's where so many bugs are hatching. It looks like a blanket of them on the water. It's, it's crazy when that happens. How are you going to get your fly to stand out in that sort of a situation? Same thing if there's just uh, a truckload of scuds or zebra or midges or whatever it is going ne- underneath the water, how are you going to get yours to stand out? Well, that's where the theory of unmatching the hatch comes in. And by that, I mean, you just go like a size up, right? If everything on the water is an 18, throw a 16 out there. Heck, throw a 14 out there. You never know because sometimes unmatching the hatch a little bit, as long as it's a bug that is close to what's out there, sometimes that will spur the fish into eating yours because they're seeing all these things hatching. Like they they see a whole bunch of size 18 blue wings hatching. And then they see a 14. They're like, ooh, a big one came off. I'm going to go eat that. That's a bigger protein, uh, a bigger value meal for me. They're going to go snag that because at the end of the day, it can be more for them. And it's a still it's still a blue wing dollar. It's still the right fly. It's just a couple sizes bigger. So that is one thing you can do if they are being really picky. Try to size up your fly a little bit. And then the last tip, number five, is make sure, regardless of if you're fishing on a tailwater or a spring creek, whatever it is, make sure you are being careful in how you present yourself to the fish. And by that, I mean, you know, make sure you're sneaking up on the fish correctly. Don't wade super close. Try and stay low. Keep your profile low. Don't splash. Don't be really loud. Keep your shadows off the fish. All those basic things were taught about how to approach fish in a way that keeps your impact as minimal as you can. Those are going to help, right? If the fish see you, they really might decide to just refuse your flies. All right. They might just sit there and completely ignore you, or they'll even rise and eat everything except your fly, and they'll give you the middle fin while they do it. So (laughs) sneaking up on the fish appropriately is a good tactic to understand And with that, folks, that wraps up our segment on picky fish. So I hope that was helpful, Tim. Uh, And if any of you, any of the listeners out here, have questions for me about picky fish, if you'd like me to follow up on any of that stuff at all, please let me know. Now, we're going to get to the Q&A section of this week's show. We're going to be talking all about some tips for planning your own fishing trip, how to control the drift of a nymph rig, tips on how to avoid spooking fish, in the best way to attach leader to your fly line. You are not going to want to miss the rest of this show. Kenny from California is going to start us off this week. His question says, Hey, Spencer, I'm almost a year into my fly fishing adventure and have been completely addicted since I first picked up that pole. Uh, I'm trying to plan a trip to camp and fly fish this summer with my brother when he comes to visit out here in California. My question for you is, how do you go about planning your fishing trips in new areas, especially when trying to get off the beaten path and out into waters that haven't seen a lot of people? Thank you so much. Your show has been extremely informative and helpful to someone brand new like me. Hey, Kenny, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. This is a really good question, uh, but, you know, I, I just can't answer it on the podcast because if I tell people how to find places to fish that are off the beaten path, I mean, people are going to come off the beaten path and I don't, I don't want that. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We're, we're going to talk about it. All right. I actually have heard that refrain from some folks like, Oh, we can't tell them how to figure out these, these places. And it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because at the end of the day, you think about it, how many people are willing to walk more than half a mile? more they park their vehicle to go fish. Yeah, very few, right? So if you put in a few, if you put in some time, you're, you're going to be able to find your own place to fish. So and I'm not even going to get into all of that. Uh, I actually, though, Kenny, we are going to be doing a in-depth masterclass style video 
on this topic at some point. So you're definitely going to want to stay tuned to the VFC YouTube channel for that. But in the interim, uh, really what I do to find new places to fish, especially if I want to get off the beaten path, like you mentioned, is I look off the beaten path. Now, I know that sounds really simple and maybe like a cop-out answer, but it, it's not. Uh, it really is as simple. If there is a ton of stuff online about a river that you're looking to go fish, chances are it's going to be crowded or at the very least, it's not going to feel all that secluded or special. Now, there's always an exception to that. I've had some wonderful days on the green and there is tons out there on the green. I've had some days on the green where I've been the only person on that river. And granted, that was in like February when it was 10 degrees outside, but I was the only person on the river. It was fun. And it felt wonderful and it felt amazing and it was secluded and beautiful and perfect, right? Uh, but that's kind of the exception to the rule. So what I do when I'm looking for a new place to fish is I look at where the public access to that spot is, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago, and I try to hike to hike, pardon me, as far from the parking lot as I possibly can. Okay, just last fall, Alex and I were out fishing this new to us little river here in Wyoming. Neither of us had ever been there, and there are three or four public access points to get into this river. And we picked the one that was furthest up the canyon. We parked the truck, and then we got out and we hiked. I don't know how far we hiked, to be honest. It was it was a mile from where we parked the truck just to the river. And then from there, we went up further. We probably went maybe a half mile, maybe a little bit more up the river because it was very hard going. It's a, it's a lot of pocket water. There's no bank. It's pretty rough country down and down where we were. So it was, uh, it was not the easiest place to get around <laughs> either. Uh, and we actually have plans. We're going to go back this summer. I think we're going to film something down in there this summer because we want to get further up the Canyon because the further up that we went, the further we went from where the trail dumped us onto that river, the better the fishing got. So it stands to reason that if we go down in there and we spend a couple of days and we really get up in there, that we're going to find some pretty nice fish. We just got to be willing to do it. So that's one way that I'll do it is, you know, and th this river, there's enough online about it that you can go find it. Again, I'm not going to name it because, you know, hot spotting stuff and whatnot, because this one is relatively unknown. But there, there is enough online about it. But even then, there were three or four other cars at the parking lot that day that Alex and I went to this river and the, uh, everybody else went downstream and we went upstream. So it, it's just a matter of, okay, where's everybody going? I'm going to go the opposite way because I think it's going to get me into some better fish. So, uh, that, that idea really does hold true in places that everyone knows about. You know, we've got like the Uinta mountains in Utah or all the fisheries there in the Sierra Nevada and California, uh, even the winds here in Wyoming. Everybody knows about the winds now. But the further that you get from the road, you will find yourself in some solitude, and more than likely you're going to find yourself in some fish. Plus, those fish probably haven't been fished as hard as the fish closer to the road, so the fishing is probably going to be a little bit better as well. Another great resource to look at if you are really curious about finding just a new place to fish regardless is the stocking reports for your state because uh, the state wildlife agencies will stock different waters, rivers, and lakes with trout, and they have to record where they do that. And that's interesting because that can tell you uh, where the fish are, you know, and a lot of the times they're doing it to help bolster wild populations of trout that already exist. So, uh, and a lot of the places too that they'll they'll stock fish are uh, places that you really can only get to via foot or horseback. So the the information will be out there. You'll find a lake, and maybe it's got a bunch of uh, brook trout in it. You want to go catch some brookies. Well, hike into that lake. Find it on the map. Hike into it. Chances are you're going to have some good secluded fishing. And it's nice because you know that there's going to be fish there, so you're not just hiking blind and hoping for the best. It's nice to have that little bit of reassurance that, all right, if I'm going to strap the pack on and go for five miles, I'm going to find some fish. And last but not least, 
nothing beats exploring. It, 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 it's hard to oversell how satisfying it is and how much fun it is to just pick a blue line on a map, go there and see what happens. I've done that quite a bit. Uh, I'm still doing that here where I live in Wyoming, the mountains by my house. I'm not, uh, I don't know everything that's going on in there. And there's a lot of little blue lines up there. And I've got plans this summer just to go up and take a gander and see where they go, see how the fishing is. I don't know if it's going to be good. I don't know if they're all going to be two-inch brook trout, but I'm going to go up and give it a shot anyway. It's, it, it, there's a decent chance that I, that I could get skunked while I'm doing it but there's also a really decent chance that I'll get into some good fishing as well. I mean, the, the first stream that I ever found like this I, it was actually by accident. I was driving from one tailwater. This is back when I lived in Utah. I was driving from one tailwater trying to go to another one and I had to go up and over two mountain passes to get there. And I was coming down the second pass and there's still like two feet of snow on the ground. It was, it was uh, late spring when, when I went and did this. and I just saw this little stream off to the side of the road. I'm like, I've never noticed that before. I've driven this road before, never saw that. So I pulled over and I looked at it and I said, all right, if I see a fish, I will get out and fish. And literally like 30 seconds after that, fish rose. So I grabbed my stuff and I spent the next four hours catching a whole bunch of wild cutthroat from this little stream right next to the road. But I've never seen anybody else fish this stream ever. And I've known about this stream for going on a decade now uh it's just out of the way it doesn't look like it should hold fish but it holds a bunch of fish including some pretty nice ones and granted that wasn't like true blue lining hiking into it all on my own but i was just willing to pull over and fish something i mean that stream is not on a map it's not listed anywhere there's nowhere that tells me it should have fish in it but i took a chance on it and now it's one of my favorite places to go visit when i go back to utah because it's just so much fun. And the nostalgia of finding it and remembering all the fish I caught, it, it's just wonderful. So you definitely want to have a stream like that for yourself. The only way to do it, though, is to get out there and look for them. But thanks a bunch for sending that question on in, Kenny. I appreciate it. Jeff from Pennsylvania has our next question. He says, been enjoying your podcasts and vids. Could you share any thoughts or techniques on how to judge slash control the drift speed of your line while nymphing, understanding the diff?" Uh, the different speeds of water at depth to ensure the most natural presentation. Jeff, that's a really good question. Thank you uh, for sending that one on in. To get the most lifelike drift possible when you are nymphing, it has a lot less to do with how fast your nymphs are moving, because you'd mentioned the speed of the drift, and a whole lot more to do with whether those nymphs have any drag on them at all. Fish will eat nymphs in fast water. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was fishing a blue-winged olive hatch, uh, in Utah on the river that runs through the town that is home to Brigham Young University. And the blue wings were coming off, the fish were eating the big duns, and I was fishing this riffle, but I could also see a lot of the fish flashing below the surface, which told me they were probably eating some nymphs as well. So they were just, they, they were eating whatever they could get in their mouth. But they were very opportunistic feeders at that point. So I tied on a little zebra midge, threw it up underneath, that blue wing into that riffle, boom, caught a couple of really nice browns actually doing that. So it will happen, right? They'll eat nymphs in faster water. Uh, you are right though, Jeff, that water moves at different speeds at different depths, which is why it is so important when you are nymphing to ensure that your nymphs are all in the same lane. And what we mean by that, like they're all drifting in the same line, the same part of the water. They're all coming down together. And this is a concept that Dom Swintoski actually talked about with us uh, in depth on episode 66 of Untangled. I'm going to link that in the podcast description as well. That's one of my favorite episodes of the show that we've ever done because of Dom's insight there. Now, Jeff, in the same vein as dry flies, your nymphs cannot have any drag on them whatsoever. The best way to check for drag on your nymphs is to look at your strike indicator. If it's drifting well and it doesn't have any drag, then your nymphs should be in really good shape. The strike indicator doesn't just tell you when a fish eats your flies. It's also going to tell you whether you have drag or if you're too deep or if you're too shallow with your flies. And we have a couple of links 
uh, or a couple of masterclass videos, pardon me, about mending and drag free drifts. I'll touch on all of these things here that you asked about. And I'm going to go link those in the podcast description for you as well as you can take a look at them. Hopefully that answers your question though, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thank you for sending that in. Staying back east, David from Maine is going to give us our next question. He writes in and says, thank you for all you do at VFC. I have heard a lot of people talk about spooking a fish. How worried should I be? Does wading spook all the fish in the river? And if I false cast and slap the water, should I not even bother fishing that pool? And is this why I don't catch fish? Thanks. Uh, (laughs) David, thanks for the question. Thank you for your honesty. Uh, We touched on this a little bit in our recent masterclass video about spotting and stalking fish. So I'll throw a link to that in the podcast description for you um, as well. So you can take a look at that. I'm also going to dive into it here. Uh, Short answer, wading doesn't spook all the fish. And no, slapping the top of the pool with your flag line will not ruin that pool for you forever. There are some caveats here, of course, uh, and I'll, I'll explain those. But wading in faster moving water usually won't spook fish unless you get right on top of them. Again, going back to my time fishing the river that flows through the town that is home to Brigham Young University, uh, I was on that river, oh, so much when I was going to school. I did not go to BYU. I went to Utah Valley University because I was not smart enough to get into BYU. But anyways, um, I was I was nymphing one day, and there would be not just one day, but there would be multiple times where I could catch fish like a rod length away from me. Yeah, they're in the faster water, they're in these riffles, and I really only had to stick my nymphs out about nine feet away from me, and the fish would eat. I was pretty close to those fish. It didn't spook them. Now, part of that is the pressure that that river receives, and the other part of it is the fact that in that really kind of faster water, you can get a little bit closer. It's not going to spook the fish off usually, okay? It really depends on the behavior of the fish. The only time that you need to worry about your wading, spooking fish, and not the only time, but when I would be most concerned about my wading, spooking fish is if you are in some really calm, slow water, or if you're in really small water where the fish are extra spooky anyways. What I mean by small water is it can be really narrow, it can be a small stream, or it can be really low, really clear really low where any kind of disturbance is going to send those fish shooting off to go find some kind of structure they can hide behind so they don't get eaten by whatever it is it's walking through right they're prey animals that's their their instinct even though they do grow up to be predators a lot of the little ones feel like prey animals uh at at that point anyways though in, in rivers like that you'll probably be fishing from the bank or from well behind the fish anyways uh to avoid spooking them And what I mean by fishing well behind the fish is there's this, there's this little spring Creek that I really like to go fish. And me and Alex would fish there a bunch together back when I lived in Utah. And those fish would spook if you got too close and being a spring Creek, the water's crystal clear, the current's pretty slow. So it's, it's very still, very calm water. And you had to be generally about 40 feet behind the fish. If you got any closer than that, you were going to spook them. You were going to put them down. So you really had to be pretty far back from those fish in order to hook into them. And that holds true on a lot of water that's similar to that. It really is just about paying attention to the behavior of the fish with your weighting. Um, If you notice that as you're walking, you are spooking a ton of fish, then that means something you're doing is spooking the fish. You're either walking right through their holding water or you are making too much noise, uh, too much disturbance in the water itself, and you need to try and dial that back a little bit. So it's not so much as like there's a hard and fast way to know when your wading is going to spook the fish as it is pay attention to your surroundings and pay attention to how the fish react to your wading, and that will help inform uh, whether or not you need to change up how you're wading. So hopefully that helps. Thank you so much for sending that question in. Nick from Utah leads us off with the next question. He says, hey, Spencer, I have a question about leaders, specifically how to replace them. I attach all of my leaders to my fly line using a nail knot. 
And what is the best way to replace my leader in this case without cutting off a chunk of my fly line? I've heard that it can seriously mess up the taper of your fly line if you do this too often. So what is going to be my best course of action here? Thanks so much for everything you've taught me with this podcast. And I can't wait to learn, can't wait to learn more. Keep up the good work and tight lines. Nick, thank you for the question and thanks for the kind words about the show. I, I appreciate it quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So most fly line today is sold with a welded loop at both ends of it. And that is to attach the backing to, so you can get it on the reel easily. And then the other loop is to attach your leader to via a loop to loop connection. And if you're watching uh, the video podcast, you'll see an example of this right now. Thanks to Alex for inserting uh, clips from uh, other videos into the video podcast here. Makes it, makes it feel real professional, doesn't it? <laughs> well, the loop to loop connection is super simple, as you just saw if you were watching the video podcast. Uh, and that's why the loop to loop connection is what so many of us use. It's simple, it's easy, and it's strong. Okay, that's the big thing to remember there. The nail knot connection, though, that Nick talks about, it is a lot slimmer. And it does, in my experience, tend to go through the guides with a lot less uh, problems because sometimes that loop to loop connection can get stuck on your guides. It can. can it can easily get stuck in the tip top or the second guide down from the tip top. And it it can just be less smooth when you're trying to reel a longer leader in. You've got a fish on. Uh, I've never lost a fish because of the loop to loop connection. I've never broken a fish off because of the loop to loop connection. So I don't think that's a real concern, but it doesn't go through the guides as smoothly in my experience. Now, the nail knot's wonderful because it goes through the guides really smoothly. But the problem with it, as Nick states, is when you need to replace your leader, you sometimes end up needing to cut the end of your fly line. Well, Nick mentioned that you could ruin your fly line if you cut the end of it. And the reason behind that is that every fly line is built with a specific taper. And that taper is what helps the fly line cast, right? We all understand the taper with a tapered leader. Well, your fly line has a taper to it as well. And if you start cutting away at the top of your fly line, you're going to start cutting into that taper and you're going to reduce how well that fly line delivers your leaders. It's going to slap the water a lot more instead of just uh, unrolling on the water. So that's the issue that you run into. Granted, you would have to cut off quite a bit of fly line to to get to that point, Uh, but it's still something that is a concern and you you probably want to cut off as little fly line as possible. Ideally, never. So the folks who I know who use the nail knot for their leader to fly connection, they actually, or leader to fly line connection, pardon me. They actually all do it uh, a little bit differently by they'll put like a 20 or 30 pound uh, piece of mono on there. It could be fluorocarbon or nylon, but it's just a piece of line. And they'll tie it about a foot long, and they tie that to the fly line. So they've nail knotted that to the fly line. Then they nail knot their leaders to that big section of nylon or fluoro. When that piece of monofilament starts to get too short, they'll just blood knot in another piece, and they'll cut off just the tiniest amount of fly line to redo that attachment. So that extends the life of your fly line quite a bit. And uh, really, by the time you cut through that much, uh, mono, your fly line might need to be replaced anyways. Now, I've also known anglers who will nail knot that piece of mono to their fly line, and then they'll tie a smaller, slimmer loop in that, and they'll just use the loop-to-loop connection there. That works as well. Uh, just sometimes a smaller loop can go through your guides a little bit better than the bigger ones. Uh, so those are two options for you, Nick. That's what I would recommend. The bottom line is, though, to avoid cutting off uh, the butt section of your leader if you can help it. Um, really what you could just do is as you get to the point where you need to replace the leader, just cut the leader like a foot down from where you've already nail knotted it onto your fly line and then do another nail knot right there with your new leader. Boom, you're in business. So that's personally what I would do. Just avoid cutting your fly line as much as possible. And with that, folks, we are going to say goodbye episode 69 and we will be back next week with episode 70 don't worry 
In the meantime, if you have questions that you would like answered, please send those on in to us. I love answering them. They are the backbone of this show, and that's what keeps the lights on here at Untangled. So we definitely need your questions. There's always a link in the podcast description for you to send those questions on in. You can get right to us via the Pony Express. Uh, Smoke signals are a no-go right now. It's spring in Wyoming, and it is windy here, so I will never see them. But carrier pigeons will make it to my house. So you can send messages that way. I'll get them at some point. <laughs> and in the meantime, if you could as well, folks, please rate and subscribe to this show wherever you're listening to it. The more ratings we get, and you know, five-star rating would be acceptable, uh, and more subscriptions we get, it increases the visibility of the show. It increases the reach, and we're able to share the good word of Untangled and VFC with as many folks as we possibly can and help as many anglers as we possibly can. So that is why your subscriptions and your ratings matter so much to us. And with that, folks, until next week, get out on the water. It's spring. Spring fishing's here. We made it through the winter. Get out there. Get some fishing done. And until next week, everybody, tie lines.